the Green Party candidate, Natalie Odd. And you have four minutes, Natalie. Thank you. Is this on? Great. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming out this evening. Um, I've been in your seat many, many times, and um, I find myself on the other side of the table this evening. It's been a fantastic experience to be part of the campaign. And um, I'm really looking forward to your rigorous discussion tonight. So the Green Party. Well, there are many, many Green Party members in office around the world. Uh, throughout Europe, in New Zealand and Australia. And where you find Green Party politicians, you find a higher quality of life, you find uh, an environment that's protected and strong economies. We would like to see some green in Ottawa. And the reason is that the Greens integrate social, economic, and environmental policy. Everything we consider is looked through all those lenses so that all of our programs are integrated. And I invite you, when you have the opportunity, to look at our platform called Vision Green. It's very easily accessible on the Green Party website at greenparty.ca. And what you'll find is that we have a very long-term view. It's not just about the next quarter or the next election. It's about the long-term and what's best for Canada over the long-term so that we can have a resilient, strong economy. We have a huge challenge in front of us that is also a really big opportunity for Canada. And that is climate change. We really need to start addressing this seriously. There have been different policies and programs suggested by the government, but nothing that's really going to address climate change at the level that we need. We have the ten enormous potential for various kinds of renewable energies. We have tidal, wind, solar, geothermal, and alternate fuels as well. And with the technologies that already exist, if we implemented them, we could reduce our, our emissions by 50%. So this is not out of reach. It's just going to take political will. And the Green Party is very willing and able to do this. We want an inclusive society. And that means that everyone has access to quality health care and education for all qualified candidates. And health care means more than waiting until people are sick. It's putting supports in place so that people stay healthy. Green Party members intend to collaborate with other parties. We want to work with everyone. We want the best ideas to come to fruition. And that means not worrying about party lines. It means working with the best people and the best ideas to make these things happen and stay out of political entrenchment. We want the best solutions because the Green Party doesn't like waste of any kind. Financial, our natural resources, or human potential. We believe everyone has something to contribute to our society. A huge issue that we're facing is the fact that 15% of our population lives in poverty. Beyond the fact that many Canadians who aren't considered to be in poverty are struggling with paycheck to paycheck. And we need to change that. We need to make this a society that is strong and inclusive of all people so that we can have a very, very healthy future. Okay. Um, so um, I really look forward to getting into more of some of the issues Tonight, because what you'll find is the Green Party has a very, very practical approach. It's not about winning votes. It's about being realistic and having practical solutions. And I'd like to add that our budget, all of the uh, platforms and policies that we're suggesting are budgeted out and our budget is in surplus. And that's also very easily accessible on our website. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Tyler Kinch, he is the NDP candidate for Calgary Centre. Go ahead, Tyler. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for coming out. Today we're having a debate, a debate that should feature all candidates. Unfortunately, Lee Richardson has chosen not to attend. That's his choice, and you have a choice too. You have the choice of who you want to be your MP. I'm here today to tell you that I think I'm the most qualified person for that job. And so today I'm applying for Lee Richardson's job. And it's unfortunate, it looks like he missed the interview. <laughs> I promise to be an open and accountable MP. I will listen to the concerns of my constituents and I will be easily accessible as I have been through this campaign. I will bring the concerns of ordinary Calgarians to Ottawa. Unlike Stephen Harper, the new, Democrat, new Democrats will act on the priorities of the kitchen table, not just the boardroom table. 
I'm a young person, and I'm a firm believer that if you want real change, you need to elect new voices, and I hope to be your voice in Ottawa. The people running Ottawa for the last 25 years promised you they'd make daily life more affordable. They did it. And today, record numbers of Canadians are drowning in consumer debt, and families just like yours are having a tougher and tougher time make ends meet. They promised you they'd reduce healthcare wait times, and we all know they haven't done that. And today, a quarter million Calgarians join the five million Canadians who don't have access to a family doctor. And a private clinic has just opened up in Stephen Harper's own backyard. They promised you they'd tackle the climate change crisis and protect the environment. They didn't get it done. And today, climate change is a real threat. And over 20,000 Canadians are dying each year from air pollution. You and I know that it doesn't have to be this way. Over the last five years, Jack Layton has proven himself to be an effective leader. He's been the only real opposition to Harper's Conservatives. We're ready to move forward. Here's the kind of change that we're proposing. Real change for the economy, real change for the environment, and real change for healthcare. We'll stop tax cuts for companies who don't need them and who ship our jobs overseas. Instead, we'll invest that money in companies that provide training and are investing in the new energy economy and green collar jobs. We'll invest in your kids so that they can get the education they deserve without mortgaging their future. And we'll answer the wake up call on our economy. We will ensure that our financial institutions are properly regulated with a thorough review. We'll shorten healthcare wait lists, not by making empty promises, but by hiring and training more doctors and nurses. We'll make sure Canada lives up to its challenge on climate change. Not with Mr. Harper's idle words, and not by taxing you and your family, but with tough laws that force polluters to clean up the mess that they've made. We have obligations to future generations. Doing things the way they've been done for the last 25 years won't build that Canada, but choosing change that moves us forward will. And the first step towards that change is electing a Prime Minister that puts you and your family first. Jack Layden will be that Prime Minister. So today I'm asking you to unite behind me and defeat Lee Richardson. The Conservatives can no longer take Calgary for granted. I thank you for coming to this forum and I look forward to answering your questions. Thanks very much, Tanya. Now, the Liberal candidate, Hee Sun Kim. Hi, thanks for coming out and thanks for having us here. This is very important for the cause of democracy to have uh, views heard by a wide range of people. I'm proud to be representing the Liberal Party. This election is about values, about choosing the kind of Canada that we want for ourselves and for future Canadians. I came to Canada as a young girl. I was born in Korea and uh, I grew up um, quite poor in Montreal, but uh, with the kind of support that, that's available in, in Canada for new Canadians and for people who are, are disadvantaged, I was able to succeed. And I want to make sure that that kind of opportunity is available for all Canadians. Equal opportunity is really, really important for me. And I strongly believe in the liberal vision of, of a Canada that balances social justice, economic prosperity, and environmental sustainability. Some of you may recall that I was the Liberal candidate in the last election in 2006. And after it was over, it really wasn't my intention to run again. Um, you must recognize that running as a Liberal candidate in Calgary isn't the most fun thing that you can think of. Um, but after it was over, and there was a leadership convention, and uh, as a former candidate, everyone came to see me. So I, I really took a, a good hard look at all of the leadership candidates. And, you know, I was so tired of politicians that will do anything say anything to get elected. And so I was looking for uh, somebody who would do politics differently. And I wasn't looking for somebody who was the most likely to get us back into power. I was looking for the person who I thought would be the best person to lead Canada. And for me, um, a couple of months before the, uh, before the leadership convention, it was pretty clear that Stéphane Dion was the right man to lead Canada. He had passion, a lot of personal integrity, and, and he was really smart with really good ideas that I thought w was right for Canada. And, and just as an example, um, the green ship is the perfect example of a great idea and of Stéphane Dion's courage to do the right thing, even if it's not the easy thing. It's a substantial broad-based tax cut that will be paid for by putting a price on pollution. 
The atmosphere should not be treated as a free garbage dump. Polluters will pay a carbon tax applied to fuels consumed, not to fuel produced. And it won't harm the Alberta oil and gas industry. Conventional oil producers don't use any more fossil fuels to pump or drill than any other industry. It will be hard for the, um, for the oil sands producers who currently use natural gas to produce their oil. But they're the ones that are causing us, as Albertans, to have 10% of the nation's population and 40% of our greenhouse gas emissions. This uh, green shift tax will give them a powerful incentive to find a better way to do it, maybe use geothermal or other renewable forces, uh, sources of energy that will not only help the environment, but it'll address the whole issue of dirty oil that's, that's, that's causing them problems um, and criticism in the, uh, in the American economy. So um, that's just one example of, of a plan that we laid out for Canadians. We have a detailed platform, all within Stefan Dion's promise not to, not, uh, Stefan Dion's commitment never to break a promise. In this election, Canadians must choose the kind of Canada they want today the kind of Canada they want to pass on to their children. I believe we all want a Canada where we look out for each other, where we ensure that no one is left behind, where we can all participate in building a richer, fairer, greener Canada. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Now, Angie Tony Burkowski, the independent candidate for Calgary Centre. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Anthony Grabowski. And uh, I think uh, already has been said, I, I agree with most of uh, this what other candidates said. Um, maybe I say something about myself. Um, I came to Calgary more than 30 years ago. Um, also, by the way, of uh, Quebec, Montreal, as I consider myself to be a French Canadian, not by birth, but by choice. And uh, 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 I came here, uh, then uh, I became uh, widowed for over 20 years and single parent, single dad. And decided to run as an independent uh, because what I'm thinking is that parties usually looking to voters as consumers, not informed voters. And voters want to be informed, but they don't get uh, that information. So I'm running as, the, as, the, as an independent uh, because I found that Canadians are apathetic to big party politics. I hope, if elected, to maintain on the relationship and the representation on, of my ranking because our opinions and issues cannot be represented when our parliamentary system fails to represent the people with uh, strict uh, party voting measures. It is time that Canadians had the opportunity to voice themselves and be more participatory to the government. For example, how the government and conservatives should produce methodologically sound research on youth crime. There is little evidence producing that youth crime is growing trend and there is less evidence across the board that more punitive measures lead to reduction of crime. The Young Offenders Act reform um, I will name young offenders potentially leading them to a life as outcasts, giving them a permanent level as criminals, decreasing their chances of reentering into society. Two, put them in jail for a long period of time while they are still in development, making resocialization more difficult uh, again. This reform also ignores budgetary constraints. Canadian prisoners are filling up and are expensive to maintain. It costs Canadian taxpayers about 100,000 to incarcerate a woman for a year. It costs average 50,000 to incarcerate a man. It costs about 200,000 in Eastern Canada, like Newfoundland. Uh, yeah, um, Canada has come to the highest rates of child poverty in the development world. At least one million Canadian children live in poverty. Those reforming this act would put more taxpayers' money into punitive young offenders. I believe the money would be better suited in preventing measures, encourage parents uh, can support their children, eliminating child uh, poverty. 
Also, we see in Calgary here, where we have in our writing here, downtown Calgary Centre, probably about 5,000 people who are homeless, and uh, we are not interested to spend more time with them to help them to find out why they are homeless. And there's lots of other issues which I would uh, uh, discuss, but my time is over. Thank you very much, and thank you for listening. Thank you. Opportunity now to ask a question if you like of the candidates, and uh, there is a microphone here at the front of the room for you if you'd like to do that. And uh, in the meantime, while you're thinking about what you might like to ask, uh, why don't we uh, hear from the candidates about uh, some of the reasons why they decided to run and why they chose the parties they did? Um, uh, both, uh, well, you, you explained why you decided to join forces with the Liberal Party, He Sung Kim. You ran for the party the last time. Um, perhaps, um, Natalie, you could tell us a bit more about why you decided to run for the Green Party. Um, for instance, inst instead of the Liberal Party, which has a similar environmental platform, perhaps not as aggressive as yours, but um, tell us why. Great, thank you. Um, I've lived in Calgary for most of my life. I'm an immigrant. My parents brought us over from England, and um, main reason for that, I have three brothers, and my parents wanted us to have really good education, and one of my brothers is disabled, and felt we'd have better opportunities here. So he came when I was very young, and I've lived here all my life, and um, I have spent some years traveling away. Um, I've studied here at University of Calgary, and also at the University of Victoria, and I've settled here with my family. I have a, a young son. Why I'm running is because um, I've been very involved in the community in terms of environmental issues and human rights issues for many, many years. And I feel deeply concerned about this. I, I see so many occasions where people are struggling when it's unnecessary. And I'd really like to make a difference in that way, especially because of my child. Um, it's an enormous motivation. I, I cared about this issue, these issues before I had my child, but um, now that I'm a mother, um, I think it's even, I, I can't not run, to be honest with you, I, I feel it's that um, important. And why it's the Green Party, I looked at all the platforms, and the Green Party just makes the most sense to me. It's a balance of practical and compassionate, and that's what I'm looking for. And it looks long term. It's not short term fixes, it's actually long term. And sometimes there's platforms in here that are counterintuitive, and I found myself explaining them to friends of mine. And it just takes a little while to talk them out, and they actually really make sense. And many of the issues we face are complex. They're, they're not uh, solved by band-aids. You actually have to think them through and do things that sometimes are a little challenging. Um, in terms of the Liberal Party, um, it's interesting that you bring that up because uh, Elizabeth May, is, who is our party leader, um, has uh, been providing counsel and expertise to all the other parties for many years because they do see her as an expert in her field. And she's... Um, stepped into the role of politician because she feels it's absolutely necessary now because, for example, with climate change, he uh, mentioned that she uh, really likes the idea of the tax shift, and the green tax shift, and I, I'm uh, glad to hear that because it's actually a Green Party concept. Um, and we go much further and we're far more effective than the liberals are. And we need to go the distance with these things. We can't pussyfoot around anymore. It's just too critical. Um, in my day job, I've been working for over five years with Clean Calgary Association right here in Calgary on the ground and I see what the challenges are and I want to stop working on symptoms and I want to st start working on systematic solutions. So I hope that answers your question. Thanks very much and maybe Tyler you could tell us um, a little bit more about yourself and uh, why you decided to jump in with both feet to uh, fight for the job that Lee Richardson has held uh, for the last two terms. Um, I'm 21 years old. I just graduated from state from the graphic communications program and I started a career as a freelance graphic designer. And I moved to Calgary about five years ago and during those five years I've seen Calgary change a lot. Um, and it's just a short five years but Calgary has boomed but many people um, have been left behind in that boom. And I don't think that's fair. And we don't have a provincial government or a federal government that is helping out the people that are left behind in the boom. Um, to go back to um, why I got involved in politics, I think I need to 
uh, talk about um, my early childhood. I grew up with two siblings in a single parent uh, household and I saw child poverty firsthand. And I believe that no child asks to be born in poverty and no child should be born into poverty. It is our responsibility as a nation to ensure that every child has equal opportunity. And we, it, that's very important. Um, if we provide equal opportunity for every child, we can, we can solve many of the problems that we have today uh, because everyone starts off on an equal footing. And um, the reason why I chose the New Democrats is because I feel they are the party that stands up best for me and most um, Canadians. Um, they're not um, catering towards corporate interests. They have a reputation of standing up for the ordinary Canadian, and I like that. And um, instead of giving $50 billion in corporate tax cuts, like Mr. Harper um, wants to, um, and that's spending $50 billion in corporate tax cuts, I'd like to add. Um, that's money being spent on corporate tax cut. That money can be spent elsewhere. It can be spent in investing in our people and our future. And that's why I chose to run. Thanks, Tyler. And he said, Kim, you told us a bit about um, what brought you to the Liberal Party and a little bit about your own background. But uh, in this campaign, what are the issues that you think are the most important for the people who live in Calgary Centre? Well, it seems to be a little bit different than what's uh, focusing in the national stage. I think um, Cal people in Calgary Centre are concerned about crime and poverty and the environment. Um, I don't see so much uh, fixation on the economy other than people who've lost a lot of money in, uh, in turmoil in the stock market. But um, in, in terms of um, myself, I guess I, I didn't get into a lot of detail about who I am, but um, I grew up in Montreal until I graduated with a degree in architecture. I practiced as an architect in, um, in Calgary for a year and then in at Vancouver for two and a half years and before I moved back to Calgary in uh, 1985. And I've lived here since then. So I consider Calgary to be my home. I always, you know, I have for the last um, substantial period of time. But I also, um, I didn't just practice as an architect. Um, after a little while, I branched out into other things. I, I own two restaurants and, and I, I hire, you know, I've got about 20 people on payroll. Um, that I'm responsible for. So, um, you know, when times were a little bit tougher, I do understand how how it takes a little bit of, you know, a little bit of hard work and sweat and worrying to actually meet payroll and that kind of thing. Um, it's not as easy as, as people seem to think. And um, and then, uh, more recently, I got involved in, um, in a water filtration project to bring clean drinking water to, uh, to developing countries uh, using a technology that was actually invented at the University of Calgary. It's quite widespread on a humanitarian basis, but um, we're trying to introduce it on a commercial basis because we recognize that you can really only get things developed and used on a widespread basis, on a widespread level, if, if it is developed commercially. So that's kind of what I do. And I do a lot of different things. And so I feel that I have a fairly balanced view of, of, of life and of how to get things accomplished. And I think the Liberal Party um, in, embodies that for me. Because I have very strong ideas on you know, alleviating poverty and you know, encouraging people. But the reality is that you can't do it on the backs of, say, corporations or rich individuals. Because the fact is, you do have to be able to finance the things that you want to do. And I understand enough about economic principles to know that broad-based tax cuts is what stimulates the economy. And to say that you shouldn't give tax cuts to corporations is, is really, it, it's really kind of narrow thinking. And I tend to think that broad thinking and a balanced view will actually accomplish more. So that's what brought me to the Liberal Party. Um, I can't subscribe to the sort of laissez-faire, every man for himself view of the Conservative Party. I know a lot of people who have sort of made it um, tend to drift towards the Conservative side of the spectrum. I know actually there's people in my own family who have done it, which embarrasses me to know it. But anyway, <laughs> um, that's not me, and that's why, you know, I'm liberal. And, Great, thank you. And Antony Gorkowski, you talked a bit about um, the issue of crime and why it's so important to you. You feel that um, it's not being addressed by the other parties in a way that you feel comfortable with, and that seemed to be one of the big motivators for you to become an independent candidate. Um, 
what other reasons do you have for wanting to be a member of parliament and not joining forces with some of the other parties that are that are there in uh, the House of Commons already? Uh, there's lots of other reasons um, uh, why I decided to run for the, for the parliament. Um, I, I think it is a very influential job that we can do a lot for the constituents and I find out that present uh, 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 MP Lee Richardson is not very approachable. I was trying to approach him to get uh, some help in my problems and uh, that is almost impossible. Like, um, Okay, I made everybody said uh, a little bit about themselves. I, I think I uh, would like to. Also, I'm also an immigrant. Uh, I was born in Poland, in Konin, and I was living in Poznan and Warsaw. I studied architecture in Warsaw and finished architecture. So I'm graduated and registered architect in Alberta. And uh, uh, then I moved to Vienna. Austria, then to Scandinavia, to Helsinki, Finland, and uh, Paris, and then uh, Montreal. But there was a very difficult time in Montreal because of the independence there and Mr. René Lebeck getting into power and so on, and they decided to uh, come west. And coming to Canada was always for me like a temporary. I was thinking of getting back, but I lost my wife. Um, uh, due to action by uh, a young offender, uh, drinking the driver, and uh, I became single parent with two children, and uh, so the life was not very good for me in Canada. And uh, right now, when I'm approaching uh, to be a senior citizen, I see how difficult it is. Uh, like. Uh, uh, there is lots of things which I never budgeted for, like, uh, uh, let's say, medical care pills were very expensive. And uh, uh, I find out that to get a doctor is very expensive, uh, impossible almost. Uh, or dental care, or all that stuff which uh, uh, are not uh, uh, that difficult it, it is to be. Uh, senior citizen in Canada. It is almost the same like uh, for my parents in Poland who, who were working for 40 years, 50 years, and when they became senior citizens, the system collapsed completely, and they become again without uh, Medicare, without uh, proper care. Uh, like uh, all the time when the state was telling them, like here, the state is telling them how good it is and so on and so on. And when you came to a certain age and you need that help, you find the God is not there. Okay? So, uh, uh, those, are, those are my problems. Like, uh, other problems are that uh, um, I'm a little bit in business, like the real estate, and uh, uh, I have uh, black and white papers that my GSP was paid and the Revenue Canada is coming after me, asking to pay. I went to taxation court and won, and I have paper from taxation court that they won. Revenue Canada is still going after me. So uh, I went uh, to, to the lens of uh, uh, fighting this, and uh, I find out that if Prime Minister is promising $500 tax uh, deduction for uh, child expenses, or get and go and prove it to, to, to live in Canada. And that is not $500 in your pocket, that is tax deduction, which may result in maybe $50 uh, credit. But, you know, you have to, you have to prove it, okay? Mm -hmm. so, that means, so there's a lot of reasons why uh, you have thrown your hat into the ring as well. And I don't mean to interrupt you, but uh, yes. I do want to invite uh, members of the audience, if you have a question or comment for uh, the folks here, please step right up to the microphone, go right ahead, and um, you can line up too, keep your place in line, and I hope that uh, you'll all engage 
our candidates here because this is very important. So uh, thank you again for coming out and please go ahead with your question. Uh, so uh, good evening to all of you. Um, I am from uh, Fairboat, Canada. We're a citizens movement interested, uh, we're a non-partisan citizens movement. We're interested in promoting electoral reform and uh, proportional representation. Um, in this writing, like in many other writings, uh, most of us are going to vote for somebody who will not be elected. If we had a modern proportional voting system, almost every vote would actually help to elect somebody. Um, so my question to you personally and, uh, and uh, on behalf of your parties as well, will you and your party support a change to a proportional voting system so that all our votes may count? Or if not, uh, why not? Let's begin with the Green Party, Natalie Dodd. Great question. Um, I, how many of you took in the federal debates last week? Okay, not surprising given that you're out here tonight at a forum. Um, you may have noticed then when Elizabeth May was asked what's the first thing that she would do, uh, it was about proportional representation. When she's in office, that's what she's going to push for. Um, the reason is the numbers are quite telling. Um, the Green Party in the last election got over 600,000 votes and not one seat. Um, this is the problem that we're having. We also have 28 MPs from one party here in Alberta going to Ottawa to represent us, and it certainly doesn't re represent the, all of the opinions that are here in Alberta. Um, proportional representation is absolutely critical in terms of having everybody's vote count, which this gentleman is saying. Um, many European nations do this already, as well as New Zealand and Australia. And there are different formulas that you can use. One that I found very interesting was that you can vote for the party that you prefer, and you can also vote for your preferred candidates. So you actually have uh, full representation in line with the popular vote for a party, as well as the best candidates from that party. Thank you, Natalie Odd. Tyler Kinch. Thank you. I am completely in favor of proportional representation and the reasons why are clear. Um, for example, in the last election, 660,000 Canadians voted for the Green Party, and not one seat went to the Green Party. And I, I don't think that's fair. 660,000 Canadians is a lot of Canadians, and they deserve to be represented. 40% um, of Albertans did not vote for the Conservatives, yet every single one of us is represented by a Conservative at the federal level. Um, and I also think that proportional representation um, will um, help take us away from strategic voting. Um, I don't think anybody likes voting for their second choice. I think that people like to vote for who um, they think will best represent them, and I believe that people should be doing that. It will give a truer picture in Parliament of um, what Canadians want, and um, it won't leave such a bad taste in your mouth. You can vote for your first choice. Thank you, Tyler. Kisan Kim? Well, I've been asked a lot of questions in this um, in this election campaign, uh, mostly by email, and so I, I've been forwarding the questions to Liberal Policy. Unfortunately, this is one that I wasn't actually ever asked before, so I can't tell you what the Liberal Party position is on it. Uh, my personal position is uh, proportional representation, I believe, would be a lot more democratic for the reasons that, uh, that, Nez, uh, that Natalie and Tyler have said. Um, there, are, there are a certain uh, chunk of people that do tend to be disenfranchised. But from a, from a practical point of view, I think if we did have proportional representation, we'd certainly have to do things very differently. The way the governments um, act right now, um, it's very adversarial. There's no sort of sense of working together for common, common interests. And so um, if, if it were going to be proportional representation, we'd have minority parliaments like forever, and nothing would get done the way people do things currently. So certainly a lot of things would have to change if proportional representation were to take place. But personally, I think it would be more democratic. Thank you. What's your position on proportional representation, Anthony? Uh, thank you. Proportional representation uh, seems uh, like um, uh, you know, the solution but uh, I don't think so that in Canadian reality it is a solution because uh, we have basically two founding nations and we have uh, Quebec, French speaking, and the English Canada and how we are going to resolve the proportional uh, representation here 
um, with Bloc Québécois on federal level. And also I will mention that we don't vote for the president or prime minister, but we vote for the MPs. It's not like in France where they, they, they vote for uh, the president. Uh, there are stages in first stage and second and maybe sometimes third stage and uh, they're still not happy because they say, well, somebody like Pompidou won the presidency by having 50.5% of votes and the loser got 49.5% and they said, what kinds of democracy is this where 50.5% is governing about the rest. So I believe we need maybe some changes, but uh, it's not as simple you know, as you. going to proportional representation. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks very much. I hope that answers your question. And this gentleman in the golden jacket and then the blue jacket uh, right afterwards. I, I recently returned to Canada after some time away that coming back to this great complacency in the north. And uh, my question is, uh, why is no one here tonight? I mean, why is this room empty? And uh, I mean, uh, have they all made up their minds like this arrogant gentleman that's not here? What's going on? Great question. Why don't we start with Tyler Finch? Thank you for that question. Um, apathy um, is not something um, that should be in a democracy. Um, it makes our democracies um, more undemocratic uh, when people don't um, show up to vote. Um, in the last provincial election, um, it was around 40% voter turnout, I believe, um, and the Conservatives roughly got around 50% of the um, popular votes. So that means 20% of Albertans elected a majority government, a vast majority. Um, how you address with that, that's a very um, complicated issue. Um, I know that people um, in my age group um, do um, consistently have lower um, voter turnout. And I believe that in order to um, fix youth apathy, politicians need to listen to youth and listen to their concerns and start speaking to them and making politics relevant to them. Thank you. Hey, son Kim. Um, I think part of the reason is the cynicism that, uh, that I expressed when I said I was so disgusted with politicians that would do anything and say anything to get elected. I think we've seen that in, in, in this last government, uh, some certain very bald-faced turnabouts of promises that are made with no uncertain terms and then promptly discarded. And I mean, it happened in my own party too. I mean, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that something like this is exclusive to one party. I really think that the, the answer to, to cynicism and apathy is for politicians to do things differently. And, and as I said, the only reason why I'm running again is because I felt that, that Stefan Dion represented that for the Liberal Party. And I think we need to find people who are accountable who will not make promises that they know at the time that they made them, that they had no conceivable idea that they were going to keep them. And so, you know, we have a very modest platform, but it's a platform that Stefan Dion has said he's able to achieve in four years, and that's all he's going to promise. He's not going to promise things he's not going to be able to keep. So, Thank you. Antony Krakowski. Well, the answer um, uh, is simple. Why there's not so many of... Uh, spectators here and, and not too many questions. We have probably 5,000 or more homeless people here in the riding and they're not participating. It doesn't matter for them. There's lots of immigration population here, lots of immigrants, like when I was collecting my signatures. And then I find out about this who not voting and there's a lot of transient population, people who are coming here just to get a job. And when I was approaching them and talking about the elections, they said, oh, no, no, we're not from here. But where are you from? Or oh, is it from Toronto or Saskatchewan or whatever? I said, well, but you are a Canadian citizen and you're now living here and you have a vote. You should go vote. And so they don't feel like uh, belonging here. Uh, so that is one of the reasons, and uh, that is an, another reason for the landslide that the uh, Conservative Party is doing here, you know, 100%, 28 out of 28 seats. 
in the last election. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Oh, thanks. That's a great question. Um, I believe that proportional representation would go a great distance in addressing that issue because I'm talking to people who don't feel like their vote counts. So why would they be engaged if they feel that their vote doesn't count? I'm also seeing from going door to door uh, in the evenings and weekends here, I'm seeing people who are exhausted. They're working long hours, sometimes more than one job, and they're having a really hard time with the cost of living. So when people are really worried about getting food on the table, um, their priority is that. It's that working, looking after their family, and almost uh, being engaged in politics almost seems to become a luxury, which is ironic because that's where the decisions are being made that affect the cost of living. Um, I think we need inspiring leaders. Elizabeth May absolutely inspired me around. She came in July, I've met her over the years. She's been completely committed to public service her whole life and has become involved in politics more recently. So she's a very inspiring leader to me. Um, and I have been at schools uh, over the last few weeks. And what's very optimistic about that is those students are engaged, they're aware, they know about the issues, and they are raring to vote. And the complaint that I heard today is that um, lots of uh, folks in the grade 12 class were ready to vote in the next election, and they weren't expecting it to be called so soon. So they're just disappointed about that. But if that's any, any indication, we do have a bright future, and I think um, having a youth branch of a party is a really, really good idea, and we, of course, have Young Greens, and it's very vibrant and accessible for young people. Thank you. Um, Mel, I think you have the next question. Thank you. Uh, I have many questions. The first one is about jelly beans that isn't here, but uh, I, I'm gonna ask a more clear question because that one's pretty technical. Uh, the question I wanna ask is, Dr. Daniel Volta is opening the Rhythm Health Clinic in Calgary in October. He's gonna charge $8,000 per individual per year to go to that clinic, 15,000 for a family. The Copeland Clinic's just opened uh, last year, this month. Your is question is? Uh, 3000 per person an annually. What are you going to do and what's your party going to do to defend the Canadian <coughs> Health Act and in, 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 in specifically accessibility clause? Thank you for the question. Let's start with you, Senator Well, this is going to be pretty tough in one minute. but. Um, the, the position of the Liberal Party is to uphold the Canada Health Act, and that means um, universal access um, and no, you know, no uh, health based on the size of your wallet. Um, as far as um, the problems associated with with these clinics, they, they tend to draw doctors, medical professionals from the public sector, and so the problem with that is that we're currently experiencing a shortage of doctors and nurses. Um, the Liberal platform has a very detailed plan for how we're going to get more doctors and nurses to, to uh, address the, the health care issue. And it's going to be based on um, increasing the number of spots for people to, to train, to fast track um, uh, certification for, for new Canadians that have uh, foreign training, um, to el eliminate bottlenecks in the, in the approval process. And, and those things will will help alleviate the uh, the current situation with the uh, with the healthcare professionals. Thank you, Anthony Krakowski. Oh, hi. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, that is a good question. Is encroaching a little bit into provincial politics and federal politics? And uh, as I said already, uh, I know that situation. Who have it is from my personal experience. And I'm completely against this. And uh, as you know from my background, I have European background, and uh, I'm coming from uh, uh, you know where healthcare, including dental care, everything is included. And uh, I I don't understand why it's going that way in Canada, and the citizens of Canada doing very little. Is, is basically up to you, you know, you voting for those politicians, you putting them into power, you know, and you do nothing against this. So I can say, why you want this? Why you why are you choosing that way? You know, you have a choice right now uh, to vote for public 
can ask Gaia or for private hey, Gaia, why are you, why are you doing this? Thank, Thank you very much. Very much. Natalie Yard. I think it's been really clear that um, our health system has been declining over many, many years. And I think that we have to also look at the responsibility of the Liberal government here over many years letting it decline like this because uh, the health system requires planning. You have to be vigilant. Even when it's strong, you have to be vigilant for the future. It means you always have to have health professionals on the way, doctors and nurses, as well as support workers need to be paid a living wage if they're not, not currently. Um, so you need to plan for that. So by the time it's in crisis, it's very difficult to rebuild, and that doesn't help people out who are sick and needing that assistance now. Um, we're in a situation now where we're actually poaching doctors from developing countries. It's absolutely abysmal. Uh, we have to have better access to education so that qualified candidates can enter into school. We need more seats for doctors and nurses. We also need to pay our doctors more because a lot of them, you can't blame them for turning to private if they have the opportunity because they're finding it very hard to run uh, family practices with what they're being paid. We have to support our medical professionals. We need more medical professionals. We need to support them. And we absolutely have to protect the Canada Health Act. No question. No private health care. Thank you, Tyler Kinch. These clinics, um, I don't like them. Um, basically, at the Coleman Clinic, it's my understanding that there's a $3,900 charge um, that they charge you up front to access doctors. And these doctors are doctors that are paid by the public system, so it's double billing, and, and that's not right. We need a Prime Minister that will respect the Canadian Health Act and will stand up to these private interests and say no to them. They can't deny Canadians access to doctors based on their ability to pay. And that's the fundamental um, um, point of the Canadian Health Act. And, and I'm actually quite disgusted with uh, Mr. Coleman um, because he, he gave a letter at a protest when his clinic opened that said that he was moving forward on Tommy Douglas's dream of Medicare. I'm sorry, but privatization of our healthcare is not Tommy Douglas's dream. And what we need to do is work within the public system with public solutions, train more doctors, forgive the debt of doctors who commit to work in, in family um, health for 10 years, and finally fix the foreign credential system. Thank you, Tyler. Uh, next question from our audience. Hi there. To get by and to thrive in today's world, literacy, including technological and information literacy, are essential skills to have. Public libraries are vital institutions which help fill this need. What would you and your party do to strengthen literacy in libraries in Canada? Okay, we'll begin with uh, Anthony, and uh, perhaps we should ask the question that came up during the Calgary Buffalo candidates <laughs> <laughs> meeting. Do you all have library cards? <laughs> I don't know. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, exactly the same as the same question, and uh, um, I, I don't think so that it's uh, as big problem as in some third world countries. But I mean, Canada is not a third world country. There is a problem of literacy here. I know about this because I was collecting my signatures um, also between um, homeless people and I'm telling you how many of them they couldn't write their name and their address and that's why they were excluded from um, supporting me, they were excluded because uh, Elections Canada couldn't read their names. They are Canadians, they cannot put their names on, you know? So, uh, that, uh, that is a problem, that is really a problem, and uh, uh, I couldn't believe it, uh, you know? Uh, and there's many, many thousands of those people around here, uh, Calgary downtown, and we have to do something about this. We have to uh, provide more libraries, uh, as long as I'm living in Calgary, uh, I remember how many libraries were closed, I don't know why, and uh, uh, they start charging fees and they, you know, more difficult. Uh, it's not right. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Natalie Owen. Um, there's a, a huge number of people who live in cities now, 90% of us live in cities, and when our tax mechanism was established, 
Uh, most people weren't living in cities. As it stands, um, cities receive 7% of the taxes that we pay, and it's simply not sufficient, because the cities are, are the um, jurisdiction that provides us with most of the daily services that we use, the infrastructure and services like libraries. Uh, what the Green Party is proposing to do is increase the GST by 1% and give that 1% to municipalities to support services like libraries because they are so essential. So we know that this is where the money needs to go and that is what we're putting forth as a proposition so that we can finance a lot of these services that are really critical um, for young people and for families. Thank you. Tyler Kinch. Thank you. Literacy is important and so is investment in our public libraries. Um, and unfortunately, we have a conservative government right now that has made cuts to literacy programs. And um, I don't think that's the priority um, that Canadians are looking to. I recently have actually received a lot of emails um, from people I'm concerned about their public libraries. And um, one of the questions was about a postal rate that libraries get for interlibrary loans. And I believe that that needs to be protected um, to ensure that libraries do remain strong. I also believe that proper investment needs to be done in information technology for libraries. Um, things are changing and so are our libraries and we have to make sure that they are most up to date. Um, with technolo technological advancements. And also we have to make sure that if there are, is any copyright reform um, done, and I do believe it, um, copyright does need to be reformed because it was a long time ago that the Copyright Act was written, we need to ensure that the, the rights of libraries and the people who use libraries are protected. Thank you. Lee Sun Kim. Thank you. Um, the Liberal Party recognizes that literacy is very important for productive um, and con contributing members of our society. Um, we're appalled at the, uh, the cuts to literacy programs that the Conservatives made, and we would restore the funding because uh, without, without proper level of funding, it, the, the fight to, um, to increase literacy in, in Canada is not going to be able to be won. And we recognize that along with education, um, literacy is, is it, a greater percent. There was a Can uh, Can Canada, um, study that showed that a 1% increase in literacy would it would increase the gross domestic product by something way in, in, out of proportion to that to that amount of, uh, of increase. So it's a very important thing to uh, to fight towards. As far as uh, libraries, um, the Liberal the Liberal Party strongly uh, promotes um, access to, to books for, for everybody and so and, and preserving the, uh, the ability of our libraries to provide um, reading material is essential to that. And so we would support um, anything that would allow um, libraries to continue and thrive. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next